O oh God. We give it unto your hands, O oh mighty God, that you, O oh God, you know, O oh Father God, where it belongs, O oh Father God. We thank you for this opportunity, O oh Father God, to bless your house, O oh Father God, to carry your kingdom, O oh Father God. Father God, give us more opportunity, O oh mighty God, that we may bless your kingdom, O oh Father God. Father God, let us not hold back, let us not restrain, O oh Father God, but give us a heart of joy, O oh Father God, to give to you, O oh Father God, to give to your people, O oh mighty God, to give to your kingdom, O oh Jesus. Father God, we thank you in your wonderful name, O oh God. We bless you, O oh Father God, and we glorify your name, most high Jesus.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, you bring a new thing. You make all things new, oh God. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jesus. Bless and say thank you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, before we go into the will of God, I would like to call upon our dear sister who has a testimony for us. Amen. Come on, somebody. Give God praise. This is my 
lost money and I tried to with that money and guess what God provided transport and He provided more transport for the next Sunday and the next Sunday and today I'm here to testify and say God is a God of provision. God is God. He does not want us to worry because worry is, is opening up to the enemy. And the enemy tries to confuse you thinking that you are nothing and you have nothing but God situation that you think is hopeless, it can be turned around. Come on, there is hope for the hopeless. I say there is hope for the hopeless. If you think you have no hope this morning, there is hope for you. Amen. I mean, that's what hopeless means. It means to be less of hope. But there is hope. If you can turn that situation around. This morning, um, I remember getting up and speaking to the Lord. The Lord prompted this in my heart and He said, I am the God who created the light out of darkness. Amen. The Bible says God created light out of the darkness. Amen. He says, I can, you understand that you can create hope from a hopeless situation. Yes. Now, Sometimes you look around and you see all these things happening to you and you tend to think of the word impossibility. Impossible. But I got news for you this morning. And let us go to quickly St. Mark's Gospel chapter 9. And I want to read from verse number 17. Mark chapter 9 verse 17 Then one of the crowd answered and said to Jesus, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. And Jesus answers the man and he says, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So, Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And his father answers and says, from childhood. To put it another way, the father responds to Jesus because Jesus says, how long has this been happening to him? And the father responds and he says, for as long as I remember, for as long as I remember, for as long as I know he's been this way. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But watch here, I want you to highlight this. It says, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. If you can do anything, come on, this is what he's saying. If you can do anything, 
if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. That's, that's kind of like saying, I don't know if you can do anything about this because this has been this way for as long as I can remember. This boy was born this way. But if you can do anything, if you can, have compassion on us, have mercy on us and help us. And Jesus says to him, if you can believe, highlight that, if you can believe, he asked Jesus, if you can do anything. And Jesus says, now, if you can believe, if only you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. God, brothers and sisters in Christ, ladies and gentlemen, the Lord our God is still in the miracle business. God is still in the miracle business. The healing business, the saving business, the baptizing in the Holy Spirit business, it all belongs to God. That is the God we serve. That is his business. Come and talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. There is nothing too hard for God to do. There is nothing too hard for God to do. It's like this man, he brings his son to Jesus. This man probably thought, this is an impossible thing. This can never, this can never be undone. This can never be fixed. You probably find yourself in a situation now when you think that, oh, this is a hopeless situation. Oh, this is an impossible situation. Nothing, nothing good can come from this. But with God, there is nothing too hard for God, ladies and gentlemen. That means there is nothing impossible with the Lord our God. Can you say that with me? There is nothing impossible with God. As humans, we always tend to think that things are impossible. We think that, you know, certain things are just impossible. They just can't happen because your mind has been focused that way, has been programmed that way. You've been fashioned that way to think that, oh, this is normal. This is natural. But may I remind you this morning that we serve a supernatural God. He's a specialist in the supernatural. Amen. So we tend very often to think, oh, this is impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. If you can just believe that, that alone, if you can just believe that, that I'm telling you this morning, with God, nothing is impossible. If you can just believe that, you'll find that the impossible is bound. It is bound to happen in your life. You understand? When it's bound to happen, it means it must happen. It means that the impossible must happen for you. Amen. What is, listen, what is impossible with man is possible with God. It is possible with God. And when Jesus looks at this man, all he just says to him is, if you can only believe. If you can believe. Hallelujah. If you can only believe. And that's the problem with many of us, with many of God's people, is they've got their mind focused on what can God do to help me? What can God do to help me? You're probably saying, Lord, well, what can you do to help me? Lord, how can you help me? Lord, how can you do this for me? Lord, how can you come through for me? Because you're looking at the situation, but you're not looking at God. You got that? Amen. Probably the doctor has given you a bad report. He's given you a diagnosis. And you know that this is an impossible thing. You know that there's no cure for this thing. Or probably you may find that a lawyer has given you a letter and you think that, oh, this is the end because when you got that letter, you think, 
Oh my Lord, this is my death sentence. Hallelujah. And you think, oh no, this is my problem now. There's a problem. This thing is impossible. And then you start thinking, how can God deliver me from this? How can God get me out of this? You're not supposed to think that way. Because the Bible says all things are possible to him who believes. Jesus answers and he says to the man, if you can only believe. Hallelujah. I'm reminded of the time when Jesus spoke to the man, to the man who had come to him to heal his daughter. And they came and said, oh, it's too late. And Jesus said, have faith in God. Have faith in God. It doesn't matter what's happening in your life. You have faith in God. If you can only just believe God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Jesus says all things are possible. My question to you is, how many things are possible? No, you're not listening to me. You're not listening to the sermon. Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. My question is, how many things are possible? How many things are possible? I said, how many things are possible? I can't hear you. How many things are possible? How many things are possible? All things. That means all. Hallelujah. We serve a God with whom all things are possible. My next question is, to whom are they possible? No, you didn't listen to the sermon. You didn't. Thank you. To him who believes. Are you a believer? Are you a believer? Are you a believer? To whom are all things possible? To him who believes. Can you say this? I believe. I say, I believe. I believe. I believe all things are possible. Therefore, it's possible for me. It may not be possible for my neighbor. It may not be possible for somebody down the road. It may not be possible for somebody in China. It may not be possible for somebody in New York. But it is possible for me because I am a believer. And I believe that all things are possible. Talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. It is possible. Amen. You know what happens too often? We look at situations. We look at the conditions that we are in. We look at circumstances. Hallelujah. But thanks be to God. Thank God that there is no impossibility in our lives. Oh man, you didn't hear me. I think I'm in the wrong place. I said, thank God that there is no impossibility in our lives. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't care what it is. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what they say. What I know is that it is possible. What I know and what I believe is that with God, all things are possible. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody once said this, we need to be possibility thinkers. You see, there's a thing in the world going, uh, going around now called uh, um, the uh, positive thinking. Positive thinking. Positive thinking will never help you. It is possibility thinking that will get you out of your mess. Hallelujah. Because though you be in an impossible situation, when you become a possibility thinker, you see yourself out of that impossibility. Possibility, it overrides your circumstances. Possibility causes you to see the possible and not the impossible. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All they're trying to tell you is think positive. No. You can't just think positive. Because when circumstances become overwhelming, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You have to become possibility conscious. That it is possible. With my God, it is possible. With my God, it is possible. I mean, look at Mary. She says to Gabriel, how can this thing be? I've never been with a man. How can this be? How can this thing be? All things are possible with God. 
means things that have never happened in the history of mankind. God can cause it to happen for you. God can cause it to happen for you. I'm reminded of the words of Moses when he spoke to the nation of Israel. He says, what nation is there under heaven that has God so close to it as the Lord our God is close to us? What nation is there under heaven that has a word, a word so sovereign, a word so pure, such a holy word, a set apart word, as the Lord our God has given the word to us. You understand that? It's a holy, God's word is holy. What does it mean to be holy? To be holy means to be set apart. You see, when Jesus spoke to that woman, they've become pleading for healing for a daughter. And Jesus says to her, healing is the children's bread. The children need to be fed first. It means that there's things that is for the children, that is not for the people outside. But the woman, she desired to eat that. She became like Lazarus, who desired to be fed with that which was on the rich man's table. And the woman says, she says, yes, master. She surely has heard about the account of Lazarus. You remember Lazarus and the rich man? That was not a, that was not a parable that Jesus was telling. That was an actual account. It was an actual event of what happened. And Lazarus would like daily, he'd sit there, and the dogs would come and leave his wounds. And he desired to be fed with that which was on the rich man's table. So she heard about this. And when Jesus said the children need to be fed first, she says, Master, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table, from the children's table. That woman just desired the crumbs. And Jesus was moved with faith. And if a crumb could do that for her, how much more the food on the table? How much more? How much more? I mean, Jesus. in the days of Elijah, there were many widows. There was famine. There was a great famine. Throughout the earth, there was famine. And everybody had this mind that it is impossible. We don't see the rain. It is impossible. We see the ground drying up. It is impossible. We see the cracks on the ground. It is impossible. Everywhere we look, we see dryness. We see barrenness. We see drought. We only see famine. And everybody was probably thinking, oh, we are dead. Oh, we are doomed. There were many widows. But the man of God was sent to Zarephath. And when he got there, he meets a widow. A widow that was also in a hopeless situation. She was gathering sticks. Gathering sticks for her own, her own burial. She was about, she was ready to have her last meal. She was at the end of herself. And the man of God gives her a word that belongs to the children. Now that is what I'm trying to get across. Is that the word is for everybody. But not everybody will receive the word. What is 
The word was for everybody. But here's this widow. The man of God says, go, and whatever you have, make for me first. This woman had nothing else to hold on to except the word. And she responded to the word. And as she responded to the word, the Bible says that for three long years, for three years, every day, God ensured that she was provided for. The flower didn't cease. The oil didn't cease. That same God that was there in their house is the same God that's in your house. Hallelujah. The same God who healed in the Old Testament is the same God who heals in the New Testament. He's the same God who heals today. He doesn't change. Come and talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, brothers and sisters in Christ, if you don't renew your mind with the Word of God, if you let your flesh dominate you, you keep on thinking that way until it is impossible. If you keep letting what people say control your mind and control your thinking, people say it is impossible, but God says it is possible. You see, that's why you've got to read the Word of God. You've got to keep yourself in the Word of God. Because when you read the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation, you see how God turns impossible situations to possibilities. Everybody's waiting for an opportunity. We have a God who gives us opportunity. He's a God of, come and talk to me, He's a God of equal opportunity. Not as our government would have us believe equal opportunity. But the world will help you think of equal opportunity. In the world, there is never equality. That's why, listen, God has no favorites. God has no favorites. The Bible says there is no variation with God. There's no favoritism with God. What he did for the one, he'll do for the other. Hallelujah. What he did for Hannah, he'll do for you. Talk to me, somebody. You know, you may find in the world, you'll find that parents and even grandparents, they have a favorite child or a favorite grandchild. And they treat everybody else different besides that one special one. In your workplace, you'll find it. The manager, the owner has that one person that they favor above everybody else. Even parents, grandparents, they do that. They've got that one. What would God? God doesn't see that one as his favorite and that one, you know, is his best favorite. With God, everybody is his favorite. Everybody is his favorite. Can you say that? Say, I am his favorite. I am the favorite of my heavenly father. Come on, do it with some attitude. I am. Come on, you're talking to yourself. Tap yourself like this. I am the favorite of my heavenly father. I am God's favorite. If you can begin to think that way, your belief systems will change. If God favored Israel, surely he'll favor you. He said to Joshua, as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. He's saying that to you this morning. As I was with David, so shall I be with you. As I was with Daniel, so shall I be with you. As I was with Shepherd, Meshach, and Abednego, so shall I be with you. Things have not changed. Things haven't changed. Listen, the leprosy, the man that had leprosy in the Old Testament, and the man that had leprosy in the New Testament, it's still the same thing. It didn't 
change. Leprosy didn't change. Sickness has always been sickness. Are you not telling me? Sickness has always been sickness. The man who stole in the Old Testament is no different to the man who stole in the New Testament. The sin is the same. Stealing is stealing. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Our God hasn't changed. Our God hasn't changed. In Genesis we see the God who creates. We see it throughout the Old Testament. It's a God who creates. Israel stood before the Red Sea. God created a way through the sea. He created a way for them. They stood in the desert, in the wilderness. There was no water. They were thirsty. He created water for them from the rock. You see? If somebody were to tell you, go stand before that rock, you think that person is off their head. You begin to question because you've been taught that way in school. You can't squeeze water out of a rock. My Bible says you can. My Bible says you can. What is impossible with man is possible with God. Say that with me. What is impossible with man is possible with God. <clears throat> God hasn't changed. His word hasn't changed. Things haven't changed. Hallelujah. Let's go to Isaiah 38. Isaiah 38. Isaiah 38. When you dare you say amen. Thank you, Father. Isaiah 38. <clears throat> I'm reading from verse number one. You're all probably familiar with the account of King Hezekiah. those days. Somebody say, in those days. Hezekiah was sick and near death. The king, Hezekiah, was sick and near death. It means that Hezekiah was lying on his deathbed. I can only imagine how many relatives came to Hezekiah to sympathize with him. I can only imagine how the physician that was treating Hezekiah was at the end of himself. All he could tell Hezekiah was, my dear king, I cannot help you. Hezekiah was sick and near death. He wasn't just sick. He was near death. He was on his deathbed. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. The king was lying on his deathbed and God gives his word to his servant, the prophet. The prophet comes to the king to come and tell him, thus says the Lord, set your house in order for you shall die and not live. Set your house in order. 
In other words, Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, it's now time for you to look for your successor. Come and talk to me. I mean, Hezekiah is king. So if God is telling him, set your house in order, for you shall surely die. He's telling him, Hezekiah, the end of your kingship is here. It's at hand. You're going to die. So get your successor ready to take over your throne. Because you will no longer sit on the throne. You're surely going to die. And not live. You won't live. Watch this. Hezekiah hears the death sentence. You got it. You are sentenced to death. Sentenced to death. I mean, this is God telling the king, get your successor ready. Get your will ready. Get your will and testament ready. Because you're going to die and you're not going to live. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall. Woo! Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord. Hezekiah, at that point, he didn't look for a scribe. He didn't look for one of his leaders to tell him, listen, get my wall ready, get my testament ready, because I'm about to die. Get my children. Let me nominate my successor. Let me declare my successor, because I'm going to die. Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and pray to God. You see, when you get a bad report, when you get a report of something that you know is not possible, you've got to turn toward the wall. There's a kind of turn toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord. And this is what he said. Remember now, O Lord. Remember now. Remember now, O Lord. How I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what is good in your sight. The Bible says, and Hezekiah wept bitterly. Hezekiah didn't just, didn't just pray, but he wept bitterly. And the watch, and the word of the Lord came to Isaiah saying, go and tell Hezekiah. You see, this is what happened. The man of God comes to him, gives him his death sentence, and walks out of his presence. And while he's walking out of the palace, while he's still in the courtyard, you see, when he turned, when he turned his back to Hezekiah, Hezekiah, Hezekiah did not look to the man of God. Hezekiah did not look to men. Hezekiah did not look to his circumstances. Hezekiah looked to the Lord his God. There comes a time in your life where you've got to turn and you've got to turn to the Lord. Your pastor is not going to help you. Your mother is not going to help you. Your father is not going to help you. Your money is not going to help you. Your investments are not going to help you. Your doctor is not going to help you. Your government is not going to help you. Your family is not going to help you. There's only one person who can help you, and his name is Jesus. There's only one person who can help you, and his name is Jesus. That woman with the issue of blood, she went from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor. Nobody could help her. It's like some Christian folk. They go from church to church, from church to church, from church to church. They're always a newcomer. They go from prophet to prophet, from pastor to pastor. Let me tell you, you don't seek for men. You don't seek for men. You seek God. Yes. 
Papa Hagen, Kenneth Hagen Sr. He shared a testimony of how he had, he had a series of preachings that they would be. They were having services, healing services. And there was a man that came with his wife so that Kenneth Hagen could pray for his wife. And Kenneth Hagen, let me, let me tell you something about men of God. If you ever thought that you can understand the man of God, you're wrong. Because Kenneth Hagen, after preaching the word, he looked at all the ministry helpers and he told him to go minister to the sick. And one of the helpers, a lady, took this woman, took this woman one side with her husband. The husband and the woman were angry because they expected Kenneth Hagen to come and lay hands upon the woman and pray for her. But he didn't. And they were upset. In fact, the man was so angry. He was angry. And the lady that was ministering to this woman was ministering healing. And this lady cursed that sickness in this woman. She cursed it. She prayed with this woman and she ministered to her. And the more she ministered, the more the husband said, yeah, but he should have laid his hand upon her and prayed for her. Because what type of pastor is he? What type of man of God is he? And the woman said unto this woman, she said, my dear sister, let me tell you, it's not Kenneth Hagen that's going to heal your wife. It is not me that's going to heal your wife. There's only one healer and his name is Jesus. She said to this woman, it's Jesus who heals you. And she prayed for this woman. And this woman left and as they were leaving, the husband was still angry. The next day, this woman went to the doctor. And they did the tests and they checked everything. This woman was completely healed. Why? Because people are seeking men. They're not seeking God. There comes a point in your life where you've got to turn away from circumstances. Where you have to turn away from human reasoning and turn to divine reasoning. You've got to turn. Turn. Turn to God. You see, Hezekiah, he turned toward the wall. Turning toward the wall means cutting yourself off from your circumstances. It means that you are in a circumstance, you are in a situation. But when you turn toward the wall, you cut off from your circumstances. And all you see is God. All you see is God. Hallelujah. There was a man of God from England who was traveling by ship. By the name of Dr. Parker a very well-known man of God. And whilst at sea, he was sitting on the deck of the ship and he was looking at the vast expanse of the sea, looking at the water. For hours, he spent hours, hours, looking at the water. Like sometimes I think to myself, you know, like brother Green loves fishing. And I know maybe it's just a little things, but how can you go fish the whole day? I mean he's there. And maybe sometimes he comes back in the evening, he caught nothing. And you think, oh, you wasted 
the whole day. It's like this Dr. Parker looking there. And he did what a waste of time just looking at the sea. And a man, a young man, came up to Dr. Parker. He was a very famous man of God. People knew who he was, and this man knew who he was. And this young man probably looked and said, I wonder what he's looking at. And he came and he said, Pastor, what are you looking at? What do you see? The man of God responded to him, without even looking at him. He's still looking at the water. Only God. Only God. Only God. Only God. You see what? In the natural, you see someone who's just staring off into space. Staring off into emptiness. That's what a natural man thinks. Yet, you find that this man is only looking at God. He's only seeing God. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters in Christ, when you turn toward the wall, God is all there is. And what you thought exists, ceases to be. Oh, Jesus. What you thought exists, ceases to be. Because when you look and you only see God, everything around you ceases to exist. I'm going to be saying that song. This is how I fight my battles. With the word of God. This is how I fight my battles. I'm not worried who thinks what of me. I'm not worried who says what about me. I don't care. But what I know is what he says about me. I know what his word says about me. I know what his word says about my circumstance. We say those words. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. You see, when you're surrounded by God, everything else, every, you see, when God surrounds you, your natural turns to supernatural. Possibility comes in to the impossibility. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, many of us, many of us have been at a place, we've come to that place where we, where we pray to God and we cry tears. Like Hezekiah, we weep bitterly because the things overwhelm us. But the secret is revealed in this account of King Hezekiah. He's looking, turning toward the wall. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. He who began this good work in you will continue doing it until the day of Christ Jesus. You see, while everybody around you is telling you, oh, it's the end of the world. All things are getting worse. All things are getting bad. It's true. Come on, somebody. It's true. All things are just getting from bad to worse. I mean, Jesus told us in Luke's gospel, he says, there will be wars. There will be rumors of wars. There will be famine. We're seeing that. And everybody is just saying it's getting worse. It's getting worse. It's getting worse. And like children, they've been tossed to and fro. They don't know what to believe anymore. They don't even know what they believe. Remember what Jesus said? If only you can believe. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. So you find people are running all over the shore. Help us, Captain. It's the end. Things are getting worse. Oh yeah, it's getting 
worse and getting worse and getting worse. Well, you know what? The Word of God says, let not your heart be troubled when all these things... You see, let not your heart be troubled when you see all these things happening. For lo, the day of your redemption draws near. You hearing me, somebody? He says, let not your heart be troubled when all these things happen. Look upward for the day of your redemption draws near. Let me tell you, church, we are not looking down. We are not looking to the left. We are not looking to the right. We are not looking to see who's with us, who's not with us. We are looking up. The psalmist says in the book of Psalms 24, he says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and the King of glory will come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, the Lord, strong and mighty. He is the King of glory. Let me tell you, brother, let me tell you, sister, you're not put looking down, you're not put looking around you. It's time you looked up. It's time you looked up. While everybody's saying things are getting worse, the news that the church has for the world is that it's only getting better. It's only getting better because the best is yet to come. The day of our redemption draws near. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The last trump is about to be sounded. Look upward. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Hallelujah. The first key to turning impossibility into possibility. The first key is this. Can you believe? That's the first key. Can you believe? Can you believe? Hezekiah turned away from his own sensations. He turned away from the symptoms of the disease he had. He turned away from his own sufferings. He turned away from all his sympathizing relatives. He turned away from the medical skill and expertise. And he turned toward the wall. The second key is what do you see? What do you see? What do you see? Hezekiah only saw God. If you look throughout scripture and throughout history, many men and women who did great exploits for God, you'll find they all have one thing in common. They got to a point where they turned toward the wall. Human help couldn't help them. Human reasoning couldn't help them. Human understanding couldn't help them. Human knowledge couldn't help them. Human skill couldn't help them. They needed divine intervention. And when you need divine intervention, you've got to look into divinity. Look into the divine. Look into God. Look, see God only. See God only. See God only. You see, when you turn toward the wall, you don't see the mistakes of people. So the Bible tells us, judge not lest you be judged. You see, if you're looking and you're seeing God, you'll never see the wrong people are doing around you. It's kind of a hard pill to chew, but it's true. Look at Moses. Look at Moses. The man Moses. The nation, the people of Israel failed you. They failed you. And they turned towards the golden calf. They turned toward the idol. They were looking at the idol. But listen, 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 listen to what happened. Moses, when God called him and said, come up to the mountain, I want to talk to you. God was saying, Moses, turn toward the wall. Moses, he left the people and he told his brother, look after the people for I'll be back shortly. And he went up the mountain and the people stayed there. You see, that's why you cannot understand the man of God. 
because his name is busy with God. And the people saw that Moses was taking too long. Remember two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, I shared with you about the account of Lazarus. How they thought that Jesus is taking his time. You see, because when you're busy with God's things, you're not, you're not worried about the things of men. So Moses was busy with God on the mountain. And while he was busy, the people's hearts turned. And they rebelled and they said, as for this Moses, we don't even know what has become of him. We don't even know. This man is supposed to be our pastor. We don't know about him. We don't know what's happened to him. We have no news from him. He hasn't even come to see us. Yet he led us out of Egypt. And he tells us he's busy with God. And while he's busy with God, God says to Moses, 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 go down for my people have sinned. Moses comes down the mountain and he sees the golden calf. The things, the spoils of Egypt, which were supposed to be used to build the sanctuary for God. He sees how the people are only partying and they're worshipping this idol. Moses takes the stones on which God wrote his word. I mean, think of this. God, 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 our creator, wrote on the tablet of stone. Moses got so upset and he threw them and they broke. So people have broken covenant with God. And now Moses, Moses now, he turns, listen, listen God saw the people had sinned. Moses turns toward God. He intercedes on behalf of the son of the people of Israel. And he turns toward the Father. He turned towards God and he says, God, do not kill all of us. Do not kill your people because the people will say, what type of God is this? He took them out of Egypt. He couldn't do anything with them, so he killed them in the desert. Moses stood in the gap and when Moses saw God, he, he, he failed to see what wrong the people were doing. You see that? When you turn toward the wall, you don't see the mistakes of people because you're interceding for the people. Look at Noah. Noah, man who saved humanity. Man who saved humanity. When God told Noah, Noah built an ark, Noah turned his back to humanity. That's why he found grace with God. Because he wasn't doing what everybody else was, what, what everybody else was doing. And it depended to God's heart that he had made man. But Noah found grace. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace and receive mercy so that we may obtain abundance of grace to help in our time of need. So Noah and his family got into the ark. The ark is a typology of Christ. The ark was the refuge of Noah, as Christ is the refuge of his people. There was no judgment for Noah and his family. There was judgment for the rest of humanity that was outside the ark. The Bible tells us if we judge ourselves, we will not be judged. If we judge ourselves, we will not be judged. 1 Corinthians 11. See, that's how you can't be judging people. Look to the Lord. He's the judge. He knows the hearts of men. Samuel the prophet went to go anoint a king in Saul's stead, when he got there, they probably showed, showed him Elia, the eldest son of Jesse, for him to anoint as king. I mean, Elia was the eldest. 
It's only reasonable. Human sense tells you he's the eldest of the brothers. He's probably, he probably was the tallest. He probably was the most good looking. And Samuel saw and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. And the Lord said, no, not this one, for I have rejected him. Do not see as man sees, for I, the Lord, do not see as man sees. I weigh the hearts of men. I don't look at the outside, but I look at the heart. The heart is important. That's why Hezekiah, when he turned toward the when he turned toward the wall and he prayed unto God, he says, "Remember how I have walked before you all the days of my life. How I've walked uprightly. Remember my heart." Hallelujah! Hallelujah! It was his heart that spoke. Your heart will speak for you. Your heart will speak for you. David was a Ziklag. All David's possessions, David, the king, King David, all his possessions were taken from him. His wives and his children were taken as slaves to Ziklag. The enemy had captured him. And David found himself alone. And the very people that had served him for many years began to take up stones. And they wanted to stone him because all their, their families were gone. They wanted to stone David. The Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. David found his strength in God. David turned toward the Lord. He turned toward the Lord. And when he did that, you know what happens when you turn to the Lord? No enemy can rise up against you. No enemy can overpower you. No enemy can overcome you. You remember the woman caught in the act of adultery? They brought her before Jesus. They said Moses commanded that such should be stoned. She should be stoned to death. We pronounce death. That's the penalty is death. Jesus wrote to the sands of time. And Jesus gets up and he says, Let him who is without sin among you cast the first stone. One by one, drop their stones and they went their way. The same happened with David at Zikri. Strengthened himself in the Lord his God. God became his strength. And all those who sought to stone him did not stone him. Hallelujah. 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 I'll share two last testimonies with you. Daniel, when the decree had gone out that he who bows before a foreign god and not the king will be thrown into the lion's den. When Daniel heard that that decree had went out, Daniel didn't start crying. Daniel went to his room. He went to his room. And he opened his windows towards Jerusalem. And he prayed unto the Lord. You see that? He prayed unto the Lord. And when he done that, when they got wind of the death, Daniel refused to bow. And they threw him into the lion's den. You see, because he looked toward the Lord, God became his strength. When he was thrown into the den of the lions, the lions could not consume him. Because God became his strength. The early church, when Jesus had just risen from the dead, I mean there was great political turmoil in those days. Because Rome had just 
began to capture and invade the city. And all that the Jewish nation had to hold on to was their religion, onto their customs. So here's the apostles. They faced the threats that Rome was breathing upon the entire nation. They faced the threats that the Jewish leaders were trying to hold on to their custom and trying to hold on to their identity. That's what they were trying to do. That's why they resisted Jesus when he came. Because whatever little they had of their religion, of their beliefs, of their traditions, they held on to it. Jesus didn't come to give us a religion. The world has enough religions. Religion kills people. Jesus came to give the world life. And that's what the disciples had. The testimony of life. They've tasted, they've seen, they've handled that which they have looked upon. That which they have beheld. That which their hands have handled. Concerning the word of life which was in Christ Jesus. They were declaring to the nations. So on the day of Pentecost, they were all in the upper room looking toward the wall. When you look toward the wall, the fire will fall. I say, when you look toward the wall, the fire will fall. The fire will fall because the fire of His presence comes down. Just on Friday evening, I had a dream. And in this dream, I shared with Pastor Shell that she was ministering. I saw Pastor Shell preaching place. It was like an auditorium. And she had, you know, that mask. So I know it's in a time such as now. And she was encouraging the people that were gathered there. And I could see that they were receiving and they were all nodding their heads as she was speaking. And there's something profound that she said. Something profound.
writes about a brother of his in the church that was sick. A brother that helped him. Because at that time they were breaking out of the Roman church. They were breaking out because <clears throat> of the doctrine. And this brother that was helping him became ill. So, he got to this brother's house to pray for this brother. And when he saw this brother, this brother was, a, he was on his way out. He was as good as dead. And Martin Luther said, he turned to the window. And all that he could do was just tell God all the promises that he could remember from the word of God. That's all he could do. Was tell God about every promise he read in the word. Remember, God says in his word, remind me of my promises. So every promise he could think of and why he was doing this, this brother on his bed, it was as though his brother, you know when someone dies, they give that last, the last kick. And this brother became rigid. He became rigid. He fell under the power of God. He fell. And Martin Luther sees this man fall. And all of a sudden, he starts shaking. And Martin Luther knows that this man is ill to the point of death. So he probably thought, hey, this man's about to die. This man's about to die. So then, Martin Luther left him like that. Went his way. And this man, he still lived. So, when this man went to the doctor to remove his dressings, went to his doctor to remove the dressings, they found that he was completely healed. He was completely healed. Now come on, completely healed. This brother gave the testimony in the Lutheran church. He said, when Martin, when our pastor Martin came, I was a dead man. I was a dead man. But when he left, I'm alive. I'm alive. What was it that healed the man? was the promises. It was the promises of God, the word of God, that this man chose to believe. If only you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Key number one, can you believe? Key number two, what do
only seeing him, not the symptoms, not the sickness, not the disease, not the pestilence, only seeing him, not seeing the listen, not seeing the lack, not seeing the poverty, but looking to him. I believe God is about to turn things around in your life. Things are about to turn around in your life. Yes, 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 yes. Waters being stirred. Waters are being stirred. Remember the man that stood there in the pool of Bethesda. Waters are being stirred. Hallelujah. It's time that you got in to the water. It's time that you got into the water. What's the water? The water is the promises of God. It's the word of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. It's only you. You alone. Oh, Lord God, who can help your people. You are the one who gives us strength. You are the one, oh Lord, who gives us a word to speak when we cannot speak. You are the one, oh God, who causes us to see the possible in every impossible situation. With you, oh God, then nothing is impossible. So we thank you this morning that all things are possible. We believe in you. We believe in your promises. So we thank you. Because we believe all things are possible. I pray for your church, oh God. I pray that your hand stretch out toward them. That Lord, you grant them great favor and great success in the name of Jesus. Lord, as they look to you, may they receive comfort. May they receive hope. May they, oh Lord God, may they be refreshed. May they be revived in the name of Jesus. We thank you, oh Lord, for the mighty move of God in this end time revival. So we thank you, Lord, oh God, for the outpouring of your spirit, oh God. We thank you, Lord God. Thank you for the glorious promises of your holy word. Thank you for the second coming of Jesus Christ, your son. Thank you, Lord, that the day of our redemption draws near. We look to Jesus, our great high priest. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you are our high priest. Thank you that you are, in, you are our intercessor with the Father. You are our advocate, O oh Lord. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for the price that you paid for us at Calvary's cross. Thank you, O oh Lord God, for the blood of Jesus. Oh, we just give you thanks and we give you praise. Thank you for your precious word. Thank you, O oh Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Ah, may the grace the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with each and every one of us, both now and forevermore in Jesus' blessed name. In blessing may the Lord bless you. In multiplying may he multiply. May the Lord God grant you great success and sweetness victories. In Jesus' name.